Hello, peeps. Welcome to the Culture and People cast. Today we have Jeff Harry, who I am super stoked and have already cracked up with for about 15 minutes. So, Jeff, in a few sentences, would you tell us who you are and what you do? Oh, so I, my name is Jeff Harry. I run Rediscover Your Play, and I combine positive psychology and play to help businesses have their most challenging conversations and address their most challenging issues, such as dealing with toxicity at work, dealing with office politics, how to get your staff in flow, how to play with your inner critic, and all of that, because I feel like a lot of times we're walking on eggshells at work, mm -hmm. and we really need to dive in and have those hard conversations, and I use play to do it. Yes, and and after doing this for 24 years now, it, I tell you how much your work is needed. So mm -hmm. because you impact, impact the workplace and the culture and people, what is your favorite thing about doing this type of work? I think it's the power of seeing people when they see each other's inner child, right? You know, when they see each other as their real you. I remember running a workshop with my friend Gary where, you know, are dealing with toxicity at work workshop um, in Australia and random strangers were crying during the session. They were laughing and crying. And then it was just like, yeah. well, what was happening? And it was simply because they were hearing their story from somebody else as to why they left a job because of a toxic person. And they were like, oh my gosh, I'm not alone. And isn't that what we want always is just to know that we feel seen, feel heard and feel and believe and, and know that we're not alone, especially at work. Yeah. And when we act like toxicity doesn't exist, we're, we're just prolonging it because listen, exactly. the rest, the humans are involved. There's going to, there's going to be fallibility and perfection, toxicity. Yeah. So the grass is not greener. It's just a different color. And there's always dog poop in the yard, right? Perfection doesn't exist. Wherever you go, you will have yeah. these toxic people, these people who don't align with you that you're going to have to deal with. Right. So yeah. we're so critically important. And I know that it helps with the engagement, right? Feeling like you can be who you are, feel mm -hmm. what you feel, uh, be empowered in the workplace that produces engagement, which produces performance. Right. And I'm hearing from leaders that engagement is a challenge right now. What are your thoughts? Oh, engagement is a huge challenge. You know, um, what are we doing in this virtual place to create a psychologically safe work environment? right? When was the last time, I say this to leaders all the time, when was the last time you asked your staff how they're doing? You know, mm -hmm. what's going on with them? Mm -hmm. And and here's another thing you could ask your staff, and this could be a really great way of re-engaging them, is simply going up to them and asking them, what is the work that you love to do most? Mm -hmm. What is like your red thread work, as Marcus Buckingham refers to it as your, or your, um, you know, your zone of genius, as, as Gay Hendricks says, like the work where you forget about time. <clears throat> What's that type of work? Oh, you know, okay. Oh, it's connecting with clients. It's connecting with other people. What percentage of time do you devote to that work right now? Oh, it's only 10% of your time. What can we do? How can I help you to increase it from 10 to 15%? Because studies have shown when you allow your staff to do that flow work, the work that makes them come alive, it actually has a ripple effect on all of the other work that they do. And if you need examples of this, you know, of proof that this actually works, look at Google, you know, with their 20% program, they allowed their staff to pursue their curiosity for a fifth of the time. And what was created because of that? Gmail, Google Meet, billion dollar adventures because they allowed their staff to play and pursue your, their curiosity. I recognize you can't give them a fifth of their time to pursue that, but you can give them 5% of time. You can allow them an extra one to two hours, especially during this time. And by simply doing that, you're communicating to your staff, I see you, I care about you. I actually want you to stay because probably what because 85% of staff right now are disengaged at work. This was a study done before, mm -hmm. you know, the pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you that some of your staff are looking for other jobs right now. So oh, you totally. need to double down and figure out how you're going to re-engage your staff. Because listen, 2021 will be a talent market. 
right? Yeah. It no longer matters where you live, yep. right? It, it Now it's a skill thing. And, and we have developed skills in 2020 that we didn't have in 2019. And so it will be a talent market. And I think one of the things I'm seeing, I want to make sure we give tactical advice. So I love the question, ask what is the work that you love the most? And then the follow-up question is what percentage of time are you currently spending on it? And how do we increase that? That's a conversation that leaders and people should be having all the time. All the time. Right. I always tell people if you're on 10 hours of back to back Zoom calls every day, oh. not only when are you getting the work done, but when are you thinking? When are you dreaming? When are you innovating and creating? You're not. And let's just explore. You know, I love talking about this recently. Let's explore the eight hour day, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what is that? You know, I, I recently did research to find out where the eight hour workday comes from. It comes from a Welsh labor activist and <laughs> business owner you know, Robert Owen in 1817, and then no yep. one touched it for a hundred years. Then Henry Ford grabs it because he's not able to bring more workers in because they're dying on the assembly line when he's working them 11 to 15 hours during the great depression. He, you know, he changes it to eight hours. He doubles everyone's salary, which caused a ruckus at the time. And then since 1920, 1926, 94 years, we have not questioned the eight hour workday. Guess yep. what? Study just found that staff can only focus for two hours and 53 minutes out of the entire eight hour day, yet our workday has increased to 8.8 .8 hours. So what are we doing with those 5.8 hours? Stupid meetings, Yep. You know, doing busy work to prove that we're busy that multitasking we, multitasking you know just like justifying our jobs yeah. you know scrolling on social media or looking for other work so if you knew that you only could get your staff to focus for three to four hours mm -hmm. wouldn't you want them to be focusing on this on the work that they do the best mm -hmm. and you know so reshape how you're approaching your staff knowing that you're not going to get eight hours of productive work you know mm -hmm especially in this tap, you know, tense time. So you need to be focused on the work they do the best. Yeah. Agreed. Do you have any tactical advice? Cause I know you've been giving some great virtual workshops on toxicity at work, office politics, finding your flow, which is one of my favorite topics. How do we actually do that? There's a leader or an employee out there who's listening to this, who says, I want our culture to get better. And you and I both know culture is the outcome of our habits and behaviors. Uh -huh. So related to the play, related to some of these workshops you've been given, can we drop a tactical piece of advice for these people that they could start practicing today? Yeah. We need to start practicing having hard conversations. Okay. You know, we, you know, uh, when I do that in my dealing with toxicity at workshop, but also in our office politics workshop, it's about like, how do you actually have that conversation? How do you actually confront that person? You know, like just give some tactile advice for dealing with toxicity really quickly. Yeah. First step would be to, you know, if they're taking up a lot of the meeting, you organize with your staff and you go, hey, we're going to take over the meeting over the next three to six months. We're not going to allow Chad, sorry, Chad, we're going to use you as the example to take <laughs> over this meeting. So if he cuts Samantha off or, you know, or Anna or me, it's just like, hey, Chad, you know, can we let Samantha finish speaking? And we start to occupy that meeting. Second, you approach Chad directly, but you don't, you don't attack their character. You address their behavior and the impact that it's actually having. And if you need to do it with other people, you know, then do it together. But you go, hey, Chad, when you cut off Samantha, not only were you telling her that you don't want to hear what she has to say in the meeting, but you're also communicating to all of us that you don't want to hear mm -hmm. this, right? Is that your intent? Because a lot of times they don't realize that they're being this toxic person. Yeah. Third, if they're like, I don't really care, then that's when you're going up to their supervisor and you explain the impact that it's having. I get that Chad is a brilliant jerk and he's bringing in $700,000 of revenue per year, but he mm -hmm. also caused four of our staff to leave. That actually cost us $1.5 million. So we're, to keep Chad, we're actually losing eight hundred thousand mm. dollars. So is that is that worth it? Does that match our values and our mission? You know, mm. and if they still commit to keeping Chad, you know, or not addressing Chad's behavior, then you have a choice as to whether that's the right place for you. But finally, and this is the biggest challenge one, and this kind of ties in with our inner critic, is we have to address our inner Chad, our inner mean critic, mm -hmm. you know, like, why do I, why do I feel, why does this person trigger me? You know, why do I feel like I'm an imposter? around him. Do I believe that in myself? Do I believe I shouldn't get paid as much as Chad? Do I believe I'm an imposter? Do I believe that I shouldn't be sharing at meetings? Wait a minute. 
I should get paid more than Chad. I should be taking over these meetings. I actually should be Chad's boss, for goodness sakes. And once you identify those boundaries, the next time Chad disrespects you, you go, don't. Don't ever do that to me, Chad. Don't ever speak to me in that way ever again. And when you do that, and it's like, oh, look, Ed and Jeff just stepped up to Chad. Everyone else starts to get brave. And then everyone else starts setting boundaries. And then Chad has a choice. He either changes his behavior mm -hmm. or he leaves because yeah. he can't be himself anymore in this right. environment because the culture has changed and we don't yeah. tolerate Chad's behavior anymore. Yes. Yeah, we don't set up those boundary lines mm -hmm. enough in organizations or communities. Like you could, you could talk about a nonprofit or a church. I was, I grew up in the church. I grew up in nonprofits. Like any system involved in humans, we're not doing enough of that. Like this is the boundary, right? Maybe it was an awareness issue for Chad, but once he passed awareness, if he has no desire to change, and we've done what we can to help him, now it's a performance mm -hmm. issue, and now it's a business issue, right? Now we've it's a and now this is costing us money. And here's the other thing: we have an opportunity right now in this really tough moment to reset and yeah. really question: Do we want to go back to normal? How is normal working out for most people? It wasn't, wasn't. you know. So what does the new normal look like? How do we have shared humanity? How do we have hard conversations? How do we create a psychologically safe place so that people can actually be themselves so that you can actually get the most out of your staff? Agreed. Oh my gosh. I feel like we could just go down this wormhole forever, Jeff, but that was amazing tactical device. Listeners do like rewind that and listen to that again, because he gave you four steps to addressing that toxicity, some really great questions, two-part question that leadership can ask of their people. And by the way, uh, peer to peer, you could be asking that too, because sometimes we feel like we're in the boat alone. Everybody else must be doing this well, but mm -hmm. I'm not right. So once we start talking about how can we support each other in getting that white space, that creativity space, that alignment, then we have a community, right? Then yes. we have a culture. I love yes, it. Yes, love it. So Jeff, let's do two quick things. One is shout outs. Is there anyone else doing some really great work in the ring around people and culture that we might want to follow or maybe even would be a good guest? Yeah, uh, Eric Bailey wrote the book Cure for Stupidity. Um, I do a book club, uh, you know, session with him every week. And what is awesome about that book is it challenges you to ask yourself in any conversation, do you want to be right or do you want to understand? Because you mm. can't do both. And that's, it really challenges us to question when we feel someone else is stupid, why do we feel that way? And then challenge us like, what is it? How am I communicating? And is there a better way in, for me to communicate? To really awesome. connect with someone. All right, we will link to Eric Bailey. And how about other favorite resources personally that have evolved your own thinking, podcasts, uh, books, yeah. even of your own resources, Jeff? Yeah, um, uh, some of them I would reference. Gay Hendricks, uh, Big Leap is a phenomenal book mm -hmm. that it talks about zone of genius and also self-sabotage, which is actually really important to address. Um, Elizabeth Gilbert um, is around Big Magic, which is all about exploring you know, genius visits you. So how do you actually birth that? Because if you don't allow that idea to, to when it visits you, if you don't let it go or create it, then it has to move on to somebody else. And that is something that is magical. Um, and then I think this is just, well, can I give them one more tip? Please, yes. So this is a really great tip to like, you know, because it's like, oh, well, how do I, how can I play more? Like, you know, people always ask me that. And this is, this is a tip you can do with your friends or your colleagues for that matter, if you wanna figure out how you can play more at work, is you reach out to your colleagues or friends, whoever the three to five of your closest people you have in your life, and you ask them these two questions. What value do I bring to your life? Like, why, why are we friends? Or if we're in the workplace, you know, what value do I bring to this job, you know, right? And because a lot of times we don't know the value that we bring, and it's really important to remind ourselves of that. And then the second question I ask is, when have you seen me most alive? And, and another way of asking that is, when have you seen me most engaged, most present, most you know driven, focused, happy, fulfilled? So what value do I bring to your life? When have you seen me most alive? You take all of those answers from those three to five people, and it's fascinating all of these ideas of ways in which you can play at work show up. And then you can reach out to those same people and be like, help me figure out how I can get there. And then that's another way in which you can play. 
Oh, those are so good. And so in alignment with what I found coaching people on their leadership and their career over the years, like we have to reflect back. And if we don't know, because we sort of disguise our own awesomeness under like this veil of society, ask those people who are around you because they're going to tell you the truth. And I think those are great questions, Jeff, you've given such tremendous tactical advice for our listeners today. And you've inspired me to play with my team more and play differently. I mean, let's stop these like zoom happy hours, please. And like do some really Mm -hmm. fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So thank you, Jeff, for all you do for culture and people and for being a guest today. Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Peace and progress guys.